Hey everyone, welcome back to Entertainment Corner. Today we're going to be doing uh, the first video in a new series I like to call Reviewing and Discussing with my father. Uh, actually, that's probably not what it's going to be called. But the first movie we're going to be talking about is Clint Eastwood's Hang 'em High, uh, a movie that my dad tried for many years to watch. but Well, a only... few months anyway. Okay, well, <laughs> he caught parts of it over the years. And uh, we finally sat down and watched it on the very low-quality VHS tape that I have. But it did the job. Yeah, the important part is the got the story across, right? I mean, having a nice picture and sound is good, but, you know, just uh, caught the first scene. And uh, all, the, all the way up to after Clint Eastwood got hung by the, the skipper from Gilligan's Island. <laughs> um, and so I was curious what happened after that and I had to leave uh, right after watching that part when I was at my dad's house so uh, I was curious to see what would happen to him. The first thing I want to say about this movie is I particularly don't care for uh, the judge character. Um, I understand that I, I understood as the movie progressed that he he had to do what was necessary uh, but I don't, I don't feel like the way he treated the guy who, you know, like he, he, he praised this man for being so good at like capturing the, the people that hurt him yet he's not willing to give any leeway or, or not. It doesn't seem like to me very much leeway in terms of, um, the law and justice. Yeah, gi giving justice. Because one of the appeals to me for the Clint Eastwood movie, especially the Western, I mean, it really any Clint Eastwood movie, but he takes justice in his own hands. In this movie, he did that, but was very restricted. Like, even comparing it to Dirty Harry, uh, he's, he's, I feel like in Dirty Harry, he still like does more what he wants. In this one, he's like, he he's really limiting himself on what he can do. Because he doesn't want to, you know, go to jail or get hung or whatever. So, well, he he wants to go after the guys that tried to hang him, and almost succeeded. And so, he, the only way he could do that without potentially getting himself in trouble was by becoming the marshal for the court, for the judge. But yeah, um, you know, you you get a little glimpse of that sort of um, respect for the law in the Dirty Harry movies, but specifically in Magnum Force, uh, where he talks to the, you know, where the bad guys are other cops who are taking the law into their own hands. And, um, you know, he's like, no, that's not going to work because, you know, what happens when somebody lets their dog crap on your lawn? You know, are you going to shoot them for that? You know, it's like there's no limits when you just do it, you know, whenever you feel like. And so uh, I do think that the Dirty Harry... Um, Harry Callahan, or is that Callahan? Yeah, that yeah. was it, Callahan. Uh, and what's his character? The character's name in this one, I forgot. I don't know. Um, Jill. Jed. Jed, not Jill. Yeah, Cooper. They always talk. They always call him by his last name. Is Cooper. And um, so yeah, I think um, I think those two characters have a lot in common. I mean, you could kind of say that uh, Clint Eastwood was a pretty well -type cast uh, actor. <laughs> so Well, I, I would argue that his characters are all pretty much the same. Yeah. Except for, like... <laughs> They're all Clint Eastwood. <laughs> yeah, except for Unforgiven, which I think that's one of his... the ones where he, like, steps outside a little bit and is a little bit more evil. Um, but, yeah, I think, I think particularly this film frustrates me more than anything uh because i see i've seen many of his other westerns and it's all about his revenge and to me i feel like i mean i'm sure there's i'm sure i wouldn't have taken every step that he would have taken in all those films but i feel like generally his actions are justified and so seeking out his revenge and it's like in this instance like i mean he was pretty close to death and you know he, i'm not saying he had to kill all of them but at least you know lock him up and that's what he was trying to do and the, the the sheriff, the judge, or whatever, made him like do it in a way that didn't feel very. I mean, it felt Clint Eastwood for for his restrictions, but I was like, I still wish he was able to to do more. 
and that and that I think the larger problem I have is uh, seeing how that relates to justice in general. It's just like it's to me it seems kind of, I guess kind of like a commentary on uh, the fact that we don't get to take things in our own hands usually, or if we do, there's there's severe repercussions, and uh, I think we're, we're we stray a little bit too far away from the real justice that is deserved. Um, and I, I just, I think that can be really frustrating. Yeah. I, th- I think the theme here, uh, the, the kind of the message that they're getting across with this movie, uh, that even Cooper kind of feels, um, that the judge is a little too care, cared a little too much about justice and the law particularly, which are of course two different things. Um, and you know, the, the teachings, the biblical teachings about, you know, caring about justice because it's important, but not forgetting about mercy. And we find that happens, that becomes an issue. When he uh, goes to uh, join the posse to gather up the cattle wrestlers, right? And two of the young men were involved in the the wrestling, which is, of course, in the movie, a hangable offense, according to the law. But... um, the, the third guy was the one who actually killed somebody and Cooper couldn't have brought that guy in without the help of the other two guys because the entire posse just took off. They wanted to lynch the three cattle wrestlers and he wouldn't let them. So he wanted to, he, you know, he's following the rules and, um, you know, he's going to bring him in and he had to do, had to bring three guys in with very limited water and, um, you know, like I said, he couldn't. He couldn't have done it. The third guy fought him, and the other two helped. You know, keep him alive until he got brought him in, and then um, you know that's where he faces his conflict with uh, his his conscience about the matter because you know the two boys basically saved his life, and then he had to turn him in and you know watch them. Well, he didn't actually watch them get hanged, but you know that's what happens in the movie. Um. And I guess you could say he gets a little bit of, uh, you know, like his conscience, you know, the, the, the original guys who hung him or hanged him, um, were after him because they knew he was after them. And so during that same scene where the boys are getting hanged, um, he's ended up getting shot by the three of those guys that don't want him bringing him in to get hanged themselves. Uh, so it's like, it, it's kind of a metaphor for his conscience, you know, it's like, he, you know, he kind of wishes he was dead and, and they, uh, they bring that because it's like, you know, he doesn't think it was fair what happened to those boys and he ends up wanting to quit after that. But the judge kind of talks him into sticking around. Yeah. That's another thing I forgot about was the, the boys who saved his life, which again, furthers my point that there's heavy i think it's people are quite hypocritical claiming to be for justice and then doing something like that uh because you do have to weigh you know the severity of a crime you have to consider being merciful and it's like at you know at what at what point is something hangable that's you know or a hangable offense that's i mean i guess that's up for discussion but I mean, I think for what they did, and and even if even if what they did was was a hangable offense, the fact that they helped bring back the guy who killed someone and didn't try to pull anything, I feel like should act in their favor. And they, he just threw that all out the window and just like, no, you're, you're dead. And I I just think that's it's um that's what happens too often nowadays, and not to the extreme all the time, but you know the the person who is you know pretty innocent or or a hundred percent innocent still gets still gets to has to pay pay some time or or whatever for something they didn't do and and it, yeah it's not fair but well there's nothing you can do about it because that's just how the law works and how our justice system works well and you know of course this is you know set in a period of time when Oklahoma which is where this happens was still just a territory. Um, and so they're following, I assume, I don't know all the details about 
you know, territorial law, but I assume that was everything fell under federal jurisdiction. And um, one of the, the legal issues at play here, we're talking about mercy and justice and judges having leeway in sentencing um, is uh, mitigating circumstances, which should have been able to be brought in, you know, in consideration for the boys' actions that they knew, like, basically they knew by doing what they were doing, they risked their own lives. And, you know, that's not, you know, and, and Cooper knew that that wasn't justice to see them punished so severely, you know, with their lives. Um, and so, uh, you know, I don't know how, you know, I didn't do a deep dive into the laws of, um, territorial Oklahoma of the, of that era, but, you know, I'm assuming that the, the logic behind it was that the, the law didn't allow for any, the, for the judge, you know, it's like they, there's, there's minimum sentencing requirements these days. Um, and that may have been the case back then. Um, so he may not have had a choice in, in, in the, in the scene where the judge is talking Cooper into sticking around. He's like, yeah, I wish I wasn't the only circuit judge in this place. And I wish that there was someone here to tell me that, you know, I could be wrong or reversing my decisions or having a legislature that writes our own laws where, you know, we can fix some of these things that seem, you know, a little too harsh or strict, but you know, it's like he, you know, he was a man of principle and his, um, you know, his first duty was to the law itself. And he was just seeing that out. Um, if the law gave him the opportunity to be more merciful and, you know, give lighter sentences when the situation allowed for it, then he, you know, it sounds like he would have, he just felt like his hands were tied and, uh, he had to do, you know, he had to follow his duty. So that's why, you know, it's like, yeah, it sucked. I, I uh, in some ways I kind of wish he was a little bit more corrupt in that, you know, taking the law into his own hands a little bit himself when it was necessary, but then, you know, that becomes a slippery slope. Yeah. I think that, I mean, that just opens the door to the conversation about, you know, this is something I think about a lot, actually. It's like, okay, well, you know, what I find judgment uh, by us earthly mortals interesting because it's like, how how can we determine what's what's offensive enough to be to to end someone's life, to hang them, to execute them nowadays, you know, it's like we all we all choose to do terrible things in our lives yet some things are i mean i think in a relative sense some things clearly are worse like taking someone's life i feel like is pretty high at the list that's pretty bad cuz i mean there's there's no like you're not here anymore so um but it's like yeah how do we how do we determine uh what's worthy of, of putting someone down for. Yeah. And that's why a lot of people are, uh, opposed to the death penalty altogether because it's like, you know, what, why does the state have the right to kill people when we don't? And it's the idea of the state taking the place of God in that case. Um, because yeah, you know, the way our, our justice system, the way our laws and our constitution are is the government derives its power from the people so they can't have any powers that we don't, I mean, at least that's the libertarian perspective on it. Uh, the government shouldn't be able to do anything that we as individuals can't do. And we delegate certain responsibilities to the government so that we don't have to take care of them uh, ourselves. But, you know, it's like you give people, you know, the, the chance to write their own laws. You know, it's like, yeah, we elect them, but, you know, it's like they're always going to try to give themselves more power. So <laughs> that's just what happens. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, for a while I'm like, oh yeah, death penalty easy. Cause I mean, when, you know, some serial killer like, you know, rapes children, cuts them up and kills a bunch of people. I'm like, sure. Yeah. Kill them. I mean, no doubt. I have no question in my mind that that's the moral thing to do. But then it's like you, you get to lesser things, things like, you know, stealing cattle and back in, you know, back in the day, that, that could actually be a really big deal considering that's, you know, someone's food that could have 
really affected the family. So I, I understand that context, but like, that's I still don't think that's as bad as directly killing someone. And so, like, where where do we draw that line? Why do we draw that line? And it's like, I, and I think the the bigger issue than that is just giving the government that power to begin with, because then they're gonna determine they're gonna uh, yeah they're gonna determine what they think is right and then just you know become corrupt and do whatever they want which is kind of what's happened now except we're not to the point where they're just killing everyone yeah. well yeah. they have you know it's like they have people who believe that that support that they want they have people who want to see you know evildoers punished and you know it's like there's there's a point to that uh there's you know some people would argue that the death penalty is an actual you know deterrent from people committing murder whereas if you just give them life in prison people are a little bit more likely to take the risk because they're like well i still get you know get to live my, my life if i get caught so um you know it's the idea of having the death penalty uh as a deterrent from committing murder is you know it's one of yeah it's a difficult choice it's a difficult moral uh conundrum to to answer uh and i would say that probably in general the 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 concept is you know it's a it's a net positive so that um you know fewer people are murdered you know lives are taken um before their time as a result overall even though you know it's like we're giving the state the power to decide who gets to be killed and you know who's not and and they get you know it's like um you know it's just we we need to be always be aware that those kind of powers uh can be taken to extremes so which is why uh, <laughs> the right to bear arms is extremely important uh cuz you know the government's always going to it's always going to look for power, always going to try to hunt down people who don't want to just submit to the government. And we see that nowadays. Like, I I have to put on such a different facade and attitude. I, I don't feel like it's not being real, but I have to really temper what I say. Like, at school, I have to temper, you know, how I interact. Because, like, all I want to do is bash the government because, I mean, I... It, it, it's actually really weird. I know this is such a sad conversation but that's totally okay I, I make the rules here <laughs> I find it so frustrating to like um, yeah I guess communicate at school particularly because I I want to be honest about what I think but I also want to do it in a way that's not going to make people think I'm like a threat or I mean I guess I care less if people think I'm crazy but I just, you know, you have to be ultra careful about what you say. And it's just, it. I, I think that's, it's just been instilled in me that I I despise the government and I want to do everything I can to get away from it. And so, um, that's why I just want to kind of escape and not live in the city and, and just kind of, yeah, I, I, I would never want to, I would never want to be in the position to, to judge someone i think i mean that's gotta that's gotta be a, a hard place to be in um i mean because even if you're not like deciding whether they die or not you're still deciding the rest of their lives or most of the rest of their lives and it's like i just i don't want to deal with any of that and it's like i just wish we could all i wish we could all be nice to each other and not want to kill each other and do heinous things to each other but that's just not how life works at all yeah, and even in the movie, you know, it's like the guys who are hanging Cooper, you know, they thought they were doing the right thing. And so oftentimes the reason, why, you know, bad things happen is because people think that they're doing the right thing, but they're not. And that's why, that's why it's important to respect the rights of others and respect the laws that are well written and, and properly written and enforced. Um, let's see they uh so he was they accused him he had the the herd of a a rancher who he purchased the the cattle from somebody and got the you know showed them his receipt and uh apparently the guy he bought them from had murdered 
the rancher and taken his herd and sold the herd to Clint Eastwood. Um, and, you know, it's like that thought never entered their mind that that could have been the, the, the course of events. And that's why we need, uh, you know, that's why we need courts to and proper legal procedures to and uh, due process, not just, oh, we think that this is what happened, so we're going to hang you, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's it's a hard balance uh, to strike, I think, to, to get it done right. And you need people who care about doing what's right. Um, because, you know, it's like, otherwise you have basically anarchy. Yeah, and that's it's just another one of the, the life's balances. It's like, how do you... Yeah, how do you balance that? How do you how do you do the right thing in that situation? Because it's one thing to to set your own expectations for yourself and you know be harsh on yourself and and whatever else. But like when you extend that to another person, I, I mean, for me, I, and I think most people that aren't like sociopaths, like oh, you know, this is another human being. I gotta, I gotta actually really think about what I'm doing here, and you know what do they really deserve and you know does what they really deserve is that what i is that what they should get you know or or you know how, how do i want to word that that's not the best way to word that. well i think the idea is like we're all kind of messed up you know we've all screwed up some way or another and uh you know we all probably deserve much harsher punishment than we do end up receiving so you know showing a little bit of mercy of compassion towards other people. And I think that's what Cooper ends up learning. Uh, one of the guys that he brought, he brings in is, uh, who turned himself in, right? Yeah. The, uh, yeah. uh, he's an old guy and, he, um, their jail conditions were pretty rough and Cooper went to talk to him and decided that he didn't want to see him die in jail. And that was part of his negotiation with the judge was, you know, you want me back, you gotta let, you gotta pardon this guy, basically, he's gotta go free, and so, there was, you know, clearly there was a way to, to affect a little bit of mercy within the justice system there, and, um, you know, sometimes we just gotta, gotta work hard to, to find those happy mediums that everybody can, can live with, with their own consciences, um, you know, the judge, you know, to him, the law was what was the ultimate importance. And, you know, at first, uh, Cooper seems like he's interested in revenge. And as it plays out, he's realizing that, you know, maybe it's not all it's cracked up to be. And, uh, you know, he, you know, he wants to walk away from it because, you know, the idea of, you know, people being punished beyond their crime was just too much for him to handle and but he was able to to turn that into a, a way to to show a little bit of mercy to the one of the people who actually were you know it, the ones who were trying to kill him by you know not showing mercy to him not not even bothering to follow the, the law the you know the bare minimum of like bringing him in and giving him his due process rights of of a trial so you know, it's like he had every reason to, to want to see that guy die, but he didn't. So it's like, what does that tell us about that character? Well, on top of the fact that, well, the man who turned himself in was was saying that he had actually advised against... Right, yeah, he didn't want it. He didn't want it, but he was part of the... He didn't stop it either. Yeah. He could have he could have pulled a gun on everybody else and relied on, on their, their not wanting to kill him because he's their friend and saying, and then insisting on bringing him in and having him, you know, judged properly yeah. and finding the real facts. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd say overall it's, you know, pretty good movie, pretty good exploration of those themes of uh, justice, mercy, the law, revenge. It's funny, the uh, the tagline on the back of the, the VHS cover says, Eastwood is judge, jury, and executioner, which is totally not the case. <laughs> He is not any one of those. Uh, he, the first guy he goes after draws on him, and he has to kill him, even though the judge insisted that he brings them all back alive. But he didn't have a choice in that case. Uh, the second guy, Gilly, uh, the 
Gilligan Island guy, uh, the skipper, Alan Hale, um, he he arrests and has and ends up going on that posse after the castle cattle rustler. So he leaves the guy um, with that sheriff in his jail, and the sheriff ends up having to kill him due to the circumstances that, that he created because he's stupid. Well, no, I, I think I think there was some. You know, there, it, it, he was just trying to do what was right. And, um, you know, the, that character, the, he was a blacksmith, and he knew what was coming for him, so he got scared. And, and what was it? Was he trying to make a run for it? Well, he was he, let out during the day. Right. Had so, to come back at night. and then Because they needed his blacksmith's uh, skills, and they didn't have any other blacksmith, so... That you know didn't make sense to just have him sitting there rotting in jail when he could still be providing the service that everyone needed. Yeah, and then I think he did try to run away. I yeah, so he, he 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 was let, even let him go home. I think right for yeah. a little bit. He was supposed to come into jail every night, and then it's one night he doesn't come back. Yeah. And so I can't remember if he if he tried to run away or if he actually pulled a gun on the sheriff. Yeah, I think he just tried to run away. Yeah, and so that's one of those things. If you're uh, suspected uh, or a fugitive from a felony or something like that, you know, you can, the law can gun you down even if you're running away from them. <laughs> so, at least at that time, there's some, still a law that affect, or that's in play in some places. Frankly, I don't think I, I think about too many of these things until I talk about them. So it's, you know, I enjoy, I need, I need to do do more reviews to really like fully appreciate a film um but yeah i i know surface level the first couple things i was thinking about was uh you know what's what's the the right choice to make all things considered and it's like i don't think that's a position i would really want to be in because i mean who's who am i to say what's fair i mean that's why I like, you know, I stick very closely to, like, you know, rights and the commandments as to what not to do, not, like, you know, what to do to someone in terms of, like, punishment. Because I just, I, I, I don't, it's just not my place. Well, the, you know, the, the real question is, you said, you know, you brought up the turn, the, you know, that turn of phrase of uh, all things considered is, can you really consider all things? Can, no. you, can any one of us... Well, I mean, just, you know, saying that, you know, this is, you know, something worth considering, that um, are any of us capable of considering every aspect of, of every conditions, of every situation? Um, and so it's like, are any of us really capable of passing judgment on another human being? Um, and, you know, those are the good philosophical questions that, you know, that we need to incorporate into our daily lives, you know, like think about, and uh, we can appreciate the people who are in those positions when they do make the right decisions and, uh, and realize that, you know, we are all just human, even when they do make bad decisions that we disagree with. Well, I also have to say immediately, if that's the way you want to frame it, then I would say no, because, I mean, all things considered, I mean, we couldn't consider what someone's thinking because we don't know yeah. what they're thinking. We don't know what if what they're saying was true. I mean, yeah. there's the whole, yeah, you better tell the truth kind of thing, but that doesn't stop. I mean, there's also laws saying don't kill people, and people still kill yeah. people. A lot of laws uh, take into consideration uh, motive and intent, and it's like, well, how can you ever really know somebody's intent? Um and so it's like, I think those are that stuff, sort of things written into there, just to per, uh, persecute, you know, people that they don't like. It's like, oh no, you definitely intended to do this, so we're gonna up your sentence uh, accordingly. It's like, well, but I'm telling you, I didn't. Well, of course you're gonna tell us that because. You know, <laughs> well, so. that also that brings me to uh, to like I, I I don't know for some reason this bothers me. I haven't really extrapolated why exactly but i i can't stand people who say well or i can't stand when people say uh like this person doesn't look sorry mm -hmm. like and that somehow factors into to the sentence they're given 
Like, there's just there's so many different ways to process a situation that just because someone isn't bawling and crying and giving the performance of a lifetime doesn't like that doesn't mean they're not sorry. Like I don't now, okay, you want to put a situation like let's say this person shoots up a school, kill a bunch of people, and then they're just kind of sitting there with a blank face. I mean, yeah, they're probably not sorry, but like you you don't truly know, and so how can you? How can you sit there and that's one of those things in judgment, like like what we were just talking about before. It's like how how can we really factor that in? And then it, you know another thing is like well, I, I guess sometimes we base it on like like people's jail sent or prison sentences can be reduced if you know they prove that they've gotten better. But it's like well, how do we really know? They're not just putting on a show, and it just it makes the whole situation that much more complicated. It's like, wh- how do you really decide decide what's fair? And it's like, again, it's back to the point that I just don't think we're, that's not really our place. But we kind of have to in some – we're kind of forced to in some ways if we want to thrive at all as a, as a society, as people on the, the earth. And it's like, you know, whether that be through courts or we just take things into our own hands and, you know – forbid people from entering our, our plots of land or, or however, you know, primitive we want to get with it. But, uh, I, I just, I, I can't stand seeing those, those court videos and then they just be like, oh, that guy doesn't look sorry. So here's another 25 years, <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm being uh, hyperbolic, but still. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, the thing that, that bothers me, well, to, to answer your question about, um, you know, determining whether somebody is sorry or not. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say in the, the, the period of time it takes, you know, between a crime happening. I mean, if it's, especially if the person is caught right away and their court date and, you know, judgment and all that. Um, you know, it's like the, the only reliable way to kind of tell if somebody's attitude has changed by looking at their behavior. And it's, they haven't had a lot of time to behave in such a way as to communicate how they're, um, you know, if they've been reformed. I mean, that's kind of the idea of having the prison sentences is, I mean, that's not the way our system works, but the idea is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a deterrent for one in that, you know, people don't want to have their freedoms stripped from them. So that's a deterrent from them committing a crime in the begin to begin with. Um, but then, you know, the other is like, it's supposed to kind of, reform people so that when they are released that they're ready to go back into society but it's clearly not how our system works um but yeah the thing that drives me crazy is when people they do that they tell you how you're feeling even though you tell them the exact opposite or you insist that that you're you're not it's like like somehow you're an expert in my emotional state yeah it's like (laughs) well you're getting a little mad there yeah i it's it just i think talking about it just makes me realize how how complicated things in life are and i know it's such a such an obvious statement but like it really drives it home you know for you yeah it things are never as black and white as everyone wants them to be because i mean how easy would that be you know if everything was black and white uh, i mean to just be good and bad, right? But that's not that's not what Earth is. It's it's a big puddle of gray, or however you want to see that. Uh, and that's something I argue with my friends about a lot. Um, and and the more I think about it, it's like, well, not that I necessarily want to admit they're right or anything, but you know, even when something seems so clear uh, as to what's clearly right and what's clearly wrong, I I mean. I don't think there's a really a way to definitively say. Well, and that's why we have our systems, you know, of, of rights. We, you know, we re- recognize the natural rights, the ones that, you know, are like if, if nobody got in our way, things that we would have every right to do, you know, um, those that generally are supported by logic. And, you know, when you, put a bunch of together, people together in one place where everyone has r- those rights, then you got to figure out how the interactions of those rights, because 
you know, my, my right to freedom of movement does not include moving on to other, somebody else's property that they own via their right to own property. So there's clearly some, some boundaries and limitations there. Um, and then sometimes those, when those overlap and contradict each other or come into conflict with each other, that's what the laws are supposed to be for, is defining how to, how to determine how to act properly in a certain you know, situation. So our, our rights are defined uh, to make it as black and white as possible so that... A solution uh, can happen. <laughs> Right. Um, and, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes if we get it wrong, you know, sometimes the law is not written, or I'd say more often than not, the law is not written very well. But, you know, it's like we try to figure it out and keep pushing for something better. Well, and that's and that's what the government's for is is to enforce those things. But they've taken on such a larger role because people say it's OK. Like people just accept it. Yeah, they, and, they want they want nanny state. They want government to take care of all their problems that they they don't want to worry about where the poopy goes when they flush it down you know the government takes care of all that right i can empathize with why someone wants it that way because if you really like to you know think about the complexity of of any situation it's a lot to deal with but that doesn't mean you should stop trying to think about it it doesn't mean you should stop trying to uh get better and, and make the best decisions you can because then, you know, what happens is when, and we see this right now, it's, it's so sad how many how many people this is taking control of, but, you know, you, you let the government think for you and do stuff for you, well, you know, you could be like, well, that's fine, you know, as long as, you know, the, 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 the right things are happening, the moral things are happening, but then, you know, then the government gets corrupt and then does what it wants and it's oppressive and tyrannical and then it's like, okay, well... Uh, you now you're a part of it, and that's not a good thing. And they they and then once they start doing stuff that you don't like, you're like, uh oh, what do I do? And it's too late. Well, yeah, and I think what what we're seeing more of is, you know, this idea, you know that morality, you know, become is become relative in the minds of people, and so um, they allow other they, they you know they allow the people in charge, the authorities to define morality when it's like that used to be, you know, either, you know, ultimately that was the kind of the, the responsibility of the church. That was the role, the function that the church played. And now the government, you know, the state specifically, uh, wants to take all over all of those powers from everybody that, you know, they, they can't stand, um, the powers of the individuals, they can't stand the powers of the family, they can't stand the powers that belong to, you know, to the church, um, to other social institutions. It's like they want it all. They want to just, you know, they want to control every aspect of all of our lives all the time. And, you know, that's the sort of thing that we do need to resist. So, but yeah, it's like, you know, it's like they're defining what's moral. And that's why, you know, people have everything backwards and upside down, you know. So that you know they're they're clamoring for evil things to be done, and um, you know we need more more people like Clint Eastwood to to go in and kick some ass. Yeah, um, that reminded me of something uh, that I heard about. I don't know where I heard it. It was definitely on the internet, but um, it was talking about how uh, the way this country was set up, or at least to their understanding, was was that. Um, you know, you have these small communities, and uh, the, the family is really of ultimate import, importance and is more important than, you know, the power that we give to the government because, you know, you can, like, for example, a father corrects his son's behavior like you've done in my life many times. It's like, you know, that's where you, that's where you help shape people into to decent human beings. And, but, but instead, the government wants to take that. And then they get corrupt, and and then they turn these people into to really crappy people, who have no consideration for anything. And then yeah, and then they they that's the thing I, I one thing I really dislike about school like public schools is like we're gonna teach you how to critically think, and then all they do is like believe us, don't question us. If you dare think outside the box, you're the problem. It's like 
That's thinking? Huh. Yeah. Okay. And so the reason why the family is important is because, you know, we, we're spending all this time with each other. We get to know each other. Um, and we can give the guidance needed to the, you know, to the individual, the, the parents, to the child, for the circumstances in that, you know, that child's facing. Whereas when the government gets involved, they want to do one size fits all. And it just, it doesn't work. It can't work because we're so different. Everybody's different. You, you can't have a solution that works for everybody. And, but that's all government can do. There's just, you know, unless, unless they make us all government, then it's like, well, then we're just right back to being individuals again. You know? So it, it's kind of funny. Yeah. It's a, it's the snake eating its own tail. The, uh, or or of us, I think, or I have to look that up. Um, well, that and something I find interesting about that is talking to people, uh, teachers, and at my school, it's like, <laughs> like I try to, I try, I try to differentiate the two two versions of themselves, the like the 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 individual human being, and then the the teacher government employee it's the facade the... the yeah and 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 that's why particularly um there are certain people at the school that who i can who who i can tell are being honest with me because they, they they can criticize the government and they can criticize what's going on and those are the people i trust because they they aren't afraid of uh, of speaking their mind and and sticking to what they believe to be right and it's like these other people um who i really really lack respect for is like they just they're like oh well you know i'm just gonna do what my boss says because you know i don't want to lose my job and it's like but at what point where's your where's your line in the sand because it's like to me i think doing what's right is more important than some dumb rule that your your boss impe- like imposes on you and it's like also i thought we were supposed to be making the rules anyway right i mean we have the power but of course our government's gotten too big and they get to and, and then it's just like at this point it's like the government can just kind of say what they want and because so many people just trust the government then um, enough people go along with it that the people who say no 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 this is wrong this is like unconstitutional uh, the, the things that happened with the masks two years ago it's like that that is now just like oh you're the problem and now you, you can get in trouble for trying to exercise your own rights and it's just you know i love america but at this point you know i, I love the ideals of america but right now this country is really going down down the drain and i i acknowledge that we're still in a way better position than pretty much every other country in the entire world and that, that's saying something um so it's like you know i i feel bad for complaining but it you know we need a just because other you know other countries have issues doesn't mean we can't critique our own and just because some other people have it worse doesn't mean we can't critique what's wrong here but it it does make me, like, I, I, you know, I read stories of people in other countries, and I'm like, you know, I really do feel bad for complaining, because, I mean, look at the, these people are being, you know, uh, you know, jailed for saying a joke, or, or they're, they're going hungry, their family's going hungry, because the government won't let them, you know, like, food's too expensive, they can't, like, it's just, but if we don't stop what's going on now, we will reach that point. Yeah, and if you don't complain about what's going wrong, then, you know, there's no incentive to try to fix it. Right. So, but how does that relate to the movie? <laughs> it doesn't have to. Yeah. These are discussions, you know. It doesn't. Yeah. These are these are jumping off points, and that and I think that really uh, grabs at what what I believe art to be, and something I find so important is starting those conversations. Mm-hmm. For me, I love to I love to go way outside the box, you know, <laughs> outside the, the box. <laughs> Get it. Um, and and just go where the conversation leads. Um, I, that's something I find really powerful about art and stories. Yeah, that's uh, one of the things about art is it's like it's telling the truth through lies. You know, it's like fiction, which kind of brings up another point <laughs> that we were talking about a little earlier and we are kind of talking about what we are going to talk about uh, was the idea I was like looking up some information about this movie and the genre listed was revisionist history which I, it's like I'd never heard that as a genre before. 
Um, and I believe it's meant to be like historical fiction where it's like it's understood that it's not something that actually happened and that, you know, the, the surroundings, the settings, the, the, um, you know, all the different aspects of, of the life that they're, they're portraying in the movie may have been loosely based on some sort some form of reality of that time period. Uh, but I don't think anybody really expects that they got everything 100% right and that the story itself maybe even have been, I don't think there's even a claim that it was based on a true story at all. So revisionist history is kind of a stretch. Uh, you know, so like just stick with historical fiction and, and call it good, you know? <laughs> so. Uh, one last little thing I wanted to point out, cause you said, uh, telling the truth through lies. I find kind of interesting. I see this uh, this moral debate on the Christian side of YouTube all the time is, you know, well, lying is, lying is wrong. And it's like, well, is it always? I mean, because if you want to frame it, frame it that way, it's like if you want to frame that these stories are lies, because, I mean, that's technically true, mm -hmm. then you're saying stories are wrong, so you're saying the Bible's wrong. I mean, like... Well, I guess I guess those things really happen, but well, some most of it, yeah, it's it's you know, but is it every little tidbit and detail? Is it some of it being told from people's perspectives? Uh, the Book of Job is actually actually is may have been based on a true story, but was actually written in the uh, style of fiction of the time. So no, I mean you know you got poetry in there. Um, that's, you know, maybe based on real things, but it's like you're comparing, you know, uh, like the Song of Solomon, he's comparing his lover to, uh, you, know, you know, date trees or something like that. Um, so it's like, oh, well, he's, he's lying about what this woman is. And it's like, no, that's not really lying. <laughs> the, the commandment is, uh, thou shall not bear false witness, which ties back into the movie, what what does it mean to bear false witness is to give false testimony in a court proceeding, right? So that's where lying has you know some. I guess the idea is like lying, kind of committing fraud. You know, anytime where you're actually hurting somebody and you're intending to hurt somebody by lying to them, deceiving them. That's you know that's where you know you've crossed the line. Uh, telling your wife that her butt doesn't look big in that dress. You know, it's like, yeah, I guess yeah, that's kind of a judgment call. <laughs> Telling the truth may, uh, may end up hurting you in that situation. <laughs> um, yeah, we definitely had to go there. But well, yeah, uh, it's just a cliche, you know. <laughs> um, you could have gone with your dinner example. Oh, what was that again? Remind me. Uh, you Like, you yeah. know, lying to your, your wife yeah, who oh, yeah, slaved over really dinner yeah and except like, in our case it almost always is yeah so and we all I, she, your mom always wants to know when things aren't up to par so she can fix it so it's like and that's why generally speaking honesty is the best policy but you got to be you know you got to consider the other other person's feelings yeah, yeah <laughs> well and and so yeah also taking that taking the real life application and then taking it into you know fiction like like i i just i think that's a really interesting way to look at things um and I, it it makes it hard for me to um to watch these people on youtube when they like get the those things kind of fundamentally wrong it's like and that's why i've like not really been interested in trying to I, i've thought about starting like a channel where i talk about all that kind of stuff but it's just like I, I just don't really feel like I'm in any kind of position to be like I don't know trying to like say things and then people feel bad for what they're doing and then they think what they're doing is wrong and then their life is yeah like, I just I'll give my opinion but like like in discussions like these but I don't want to go on there trying to like say like oh I know it's right because I I mean. I could be I could be wrong about my take on things, and so to act kind of like an authority figure, which is 
you know, I, I kind of see it as the same kind of my issues with churches. It's like pastors taking the role of God and, you know, being like, this is right, this is wrong, when it's like, oh, but, you know. And so I, I, kind, of, I kind of feel like that's what people on YouTube do. And so uh, there's just online pastors, and then it's like, they, they, well, you watch this video, it's got a million views, and tons of people saying, this is great, thank you, you changed my life. And I'm like, well, maybe this person's right. But, but then it's just like, you know, what is... What is truly right, and that's back to the, back to the question, and it's like that's why that's why I have the Ten Commandments to, to list things out for you, and I, I appreciate how specifically worded they are, uh, in regards to the uh, the one we we're talking about shall not fair balls ah, shall not bear false witness or fair balls you know whatever <laughs> whatever <laughs> um, <laughs> you know and then like. For example, the the Second Amendment, um, not commandment. I'm not mis misspeaking. Um, to the right to bear arms is like people are always like, well, that means like muskets and like only against the government. And I was like, it's, it's very s explicitly not what that says. Um, and I, I just uh, so the people who who wrote those things, um, very wise people. I'll say that. Um, and. I guess uh, we'll just have to do, have to do our best every day. I think that's all I have to say for this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what movie were we talking about again? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Some some movie called some um, by Kent East, uh, uh, Westwood or whatever. Yeah, uh, Wormwood, right? Yeah. No. Yeah, Wormwood. Uh, <laughs> no, um, I'd say probably not. You know, my favorite Clint Eastwood movie, but um, I pretty much like just about everything I've seen of his. So, um, still definitely worth a watch. Uh, you know, like I said, you know, it does explore some, some pretty deep themes. Uh, you know, if you want to, to look beyond just, a uh, the storyline of, uh, you know, kind of a revenge with a twist of law in there. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, I, I will agree. I also don't think it's like my favorite flick of his. I, I don't if I had to pick one. I, I'd probably just go with what everyone else says in Gran Torino, but I also really love the first Dirty Harry, the first two. I mean, really the first four. The fifth one sucks a lot, but any one of the first four are pretty good. But I don't know. I mean, there's there's something to love about. Don't you love Cry Macho? Oh, gosh, no. Starring the corpse of Clint Eastwood. <laughs> uh, you mean Kent Wormwood? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, but I, I feel like most of his movies that I've seen so far, far have have offered something. Have offered good entertainment at the very least. It's, nothing's ever been like like uh, terrible, uh, other than Cray Macho. Everything pre two thousand ten or something, you know, I've that I've seen. I I've gotten quite a bit of enjoyment out of. But this one's definitely I think a little bit lower on the list. Just just for some of the things we talked about. Um, also, I also tend to prefer... It's interesting. I I really like... Uh, I really like the kind of Western way of living, like, in these movies, but I tend to enjoy the city movies more. <laughs> like, I like seeing thugs get, you know, taken down by mm -hmm. Clint Eastwood in, in the cities. And I just love the action-packed stuff, you know, destroying whole city streets. Car, car chases and, <laughs> and blowing things up, you know. Yeah, but although let's see, what was it? Two. Um, there's a lot of movies where he's blowing a lot of things up. Um, what was that? The two mules for Sister Sarah. Sister Sarah, yeah. yeah he does. There's a lot of blowing stuff up in that one. That's uh, that's also a western. Yep. So you get you get a little bit, and you know he gets into a little bit of a bigger city. You know, set in the it was it 1800s sometime. I think. Down in Mexico, down in Mexico way, and he starts lobbing dynamite at the uh, Federales or, or whoever, the Mexican army guys. That was fun. That was a good movie. There was a, there's one called uh, Coogan's Bluff, which is kind of like what they call pre-Dirty Harry. And it, it was kind of a mix of, of kind of that western but also big city. Yeah, where he starts out in Arizona tracking a guy. And then uh, just like the old, so it's like kind of a, his introduction, his leaving the Western world behind and, and going into the cop movie world. Yeah, and then just so. at that point... Pretty, well, he did Pale Rider in the 80s, but 
Yeah, pretty gotta, much. You got to go back to the to your roots at some point. Yeah. But yeah, Good mainly movie. he moved back into the. the yeah, city. Unforgiven. That was another one. Yeah, that too. Uh, I really. Yeah, I will say. Um, if we, you know, I'll have to wrap this up, but uh, I will say I liked. Um, I think my favorite. Favorite, like, more Western, well, this one definitely is Western, um, from Clint Eastwood, is, I don't remember what it's called, but it's that one where, uh, I think it's, I think they're right by, like, a lake, and it's this wooden town, and I think what they do, uh, he, he kind of takes over the, like, he's like, oh, we'll help well, I'll help your town. Are you talking if you give about the uh, High Plains Drifter? Yeah, I think it's that one. That yeah, one where, was where really he, good. You know, he's he's the hero, but like one of the first things he does is rape a woman. You know. Well, okay, <laughs> that's not why I like it, but <laughs> but if you watch the movie, you it's still kind of a weird uh, a weird scene, but you kind of understand why he does it. So that's not a justification, by the way. YouTube, don't take yeah. it down. Um, but, well, it's, it's it's the idea is like you understand why he how he can still be considered the hero of the movie and have done something so heinous, yeah. So yeah, but I I, I really like that one for um, I I mean I just like the town like I just think it looks cool. I think stories are are probably more important, but when you have it, um, when you have it presented visually in such an appealing way, it. it it um, wants to bring you back, and so I, re- I really particularly enjoy the shot choices in that, like the way that the town looked and yeah, the location. Yeah, so. that's pretty cool. Anyway, that concludes uh, episode number one with my father. If he wants to give his name, not his full name, but maybe his first name or a code name, whatever you choose. Tim's right fine. You can call me Tim. Okay. Well, I can't, but you guys can. Well, maybe when when you turn eighteen. Why? <laughs> no. Pop. Pop. Pop's fine. Uh, I like a lollipop. Actually, yeah, don't say that. That's weird. Uh, I actually usually just call him dad. Anyway, why are we telling these people this stuff? Anyway. Just um, edit it out later. <laughs> I probably will edit out most of it. No. Um, edit the part out where I got the cramp in my leg and I was trying to hide it. <laughs> um, I don't know what we're going to review next time. Uh, we do a family night every week and usually we watch movies, but... So actually, I thought we were gonna. I thought we were gonna review Wait Until Dark this time. She's like, no, no, we're gonna. Do yeah, hang, I, hang them high. I like. I like the idea of uh, reviewing something we've watched a little bit more recently, so it's fresh in my head. Yeah. But yeah, maybe if we do Wait Until Dark, then we'll maybe watch that again. Sure, I'll, I'll watch before. it a third time. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think that one's that one's a pretty good movie, though. I think it's still pretty fresh in my mind. Yeah. So we'll um, see. Yeah, we'll see what happens next. I think we're gonna try to do this bi-weekly, so maybe. The Saturday after next, we'll see another one or Sunday, depending on when. I probably will upload it tomorrow. Yeah, we don't. I I don't know. I mean, everyone's schedules are crazy. We'll try to do it as often as we can, but yeah. And I'll try to review more on my own. I don't know how intense I'll get with it, but um, been trying to watch a movie every night. You guys, if anyone here is a loyal fan, you'll have seen my previous videos where I talked about what I did with my shelves. So, uh, thanks for watching. I'll, I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace out.